Welcome back, everyone. We have a really exciting panel to, to end our, our uh, first day at Capitol Hill Ocean Week. It's called the Next Wave Emerging Leaders Roundtable. You know, our oceans and Great Lakes need visionary leaders. So I'm very excited to have a panel here that's going to talk about how they see ocean and other environmental sustainability issues. And we're very lucky to have the panel be kicked off by Congressman Panetta. Uh, Congressman Panetta um, is, is from California, and he is joining us um, to talk about his vision for our oceans. California is home to four national marine sanctuaries, and including Monterey Bay, which is in his backyard. So without uh, further ado, let me introduce the Congressman. Thank you. I appreciate that, Chris. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Chris, obviously, thank you for that introduction. And also, uh, thank you for all of your work, Chris. I truly appreciate what you've done uh, on the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation. Uh, thank you to the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation uh, for putting on the Capitol Hill Ocean Week. Uh, thanks to all, it's all of you for being here. Thanks to our participants in the roundtable uh, that you're coming up, that you're going to be hearing coming up. Uh, I am uh, truly appreciative and amazed that there are so many people here for this conference in Washington, D.C., who are focused on an issue that I feel uh, is our future, and that's our oceans. Um, for me, the ocean has always played an important part. And where I come from, where I hail from, uh, it is truly part of people's lives. My district is the central coast of California the 20th Congressional District. Um, it includes such areas that you've probably heard of, from the scenic coastline of Big Sur to the Santa Cruz Beach and Boardwalk, from Pebble Beach to Carmel Beach, from Point Lobo State Reserve to Elkhorn Slough National Reserve, and it includes the Monterey Bay Aquarium and, of course, the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. So to the dismay of my colleagues in Congress, as how you know, angry they get when I say this, but I feel I have justification saying that I do come from the most beautiful district in our nation. Uh, and my, run, my roots run deep in that area. It is my home. Uh, I'm fortunate enough that my grandfather, an Italian immigrant in the 1930s, settled there after uh, coming through Ellis Island and making his way across the country, uh, where he raised his, he and my grandmother were raised to his two kids, my father and my uncle, up on Spaghetti Hill with all the other Italian fishermen that were in that area. And my father and mother chose to raise myself and my two brothers in that same area. And now my wife and I raise our two daughters there on the Monterey Peninsula. Um, I, I, I love it. They go to the same schools uh, that I went to, if you can imagine that. Uh, it is truly our home. And it makes me very proud because I know they're going to have the same sense of belonging to that, to that area as I do. They're going to have that same sense of service to that area that I do and to their community, to their country, to their future, and to their families. Uh, and I saw that this weekend. Uh, this past weekend, I was able to take part in a marine mammal release, where we went to the beach there uh, in Carmel, and we released five harbor seals. And it was, it was wonderful. Don't get me wrong. It was wonderful to see these five harbor, harbor seals waddle down the beach, get into the ocean, pop under the water, and then all pop up together their five little heads. But I have to tell you what I remember the most. What I remember the most is standing there with my 10-year-old daughter, Giovanna. And as we're watching the seals, I'm just hearing her giggle. That's all I'm hearing, this laughter of enjoyment watching this interaction with our ocean. She'll never forget that. And I'll never forget hearing her laugh. The day before, we went down to Big Sur. I had to go visit the people in that enclave who are actually isolated right now due to that big slide I'm sure you've probably seen on the news, and then the bridge being out just north of Big Sur. And as we're driving down there, as probably many of you have been down the coastline, it can take a little bit to get down there. Uh, and for kids who are 10 and 12, my other daughter's 12, uh, it can be a little bit boring. But you know, they're, what they're, they're going to remember, though, is not that long drive, but the short burst of whale spouts that we saw all along our drive. I always remember those trips with my parents. And I know my father remembered the, the trips down that coastline with his parents. Those are the mem those moments, those are our memories of our community, of our family, and how intertwined and integral 
the ocean is. That's what gives us our sense of belonging. But it also gives us our sense of responsibility to give back to our oceans. And that's what I found myself doing growing up. After college, I worked on a NOAA ship up off the coast of Alaska where I took, uh, took part in conducting hydrographic research. Now, I could probably leave it at that. You might be impressed. But to be honest, I was an ordinary seaman. So on that ship, I busted a lot of paint, cleaned a lot of toilets, and greased a lot of lines. But it gave me an appreciation of what it takes to do research in our oceans. Subsequent to that, I was on the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary Advisory Council, where I saw what it took to be responsible for a sanctuary. Not just the work, but the people that need to be involved, from scientists to conservationists, from fishermen to hospitality businessmen, and from teachers to local leaders. What you saw is that you need to have everybody at the table when it comes to being a part and playing a part in our sanctuaries. And what you'll find out is that when you do that, you realize that we all have the same goals. And now in my service in Congress, basically be on the Natural Resources Committee, working with leaders like Congressman Derek Kilmore, who you'll hear from tomorrow, and protecting our oceans, but also pushing back on our administration. Now, the actions that the administration has taken in the last six months, you would think that they do not have the same goals that all of we do, that all, that all of us do. They have shrunken from our responsibility when it comes from international treaties dealing with climate change, they have signed an executive order with the goal of finding the mineral and energy potential of our na national sanctuaries and national monuments. And they made a proclamation this month that it's National Ocean Munch Month. I don't know if anybody, anybody heard of that. I just Googled it last night and I found out. But what it is, when you look at it, it's actually a doctrine for oil exploration, if you ask me. Because when you see this, and I brought this, it's a one page 2017 is, June 2017, is National Ocean Month, as declared by Donald Trump. And let me read you some of these quotes in it. America's sovereign right is to explore, exploit ocean resources. Offshore areas are underutilized and often unexplored, and we need to unleash the forces of economic innovation to more fully develop and explore our ocean economy. Another quote. We have just begun to tap the potential of our ocean's oil and gas resources to power our nation. Like I said, I don't think that the administration has the same goals that many of us do. But every day you need to know that members up in Congress are fighting, fighting against this administration when it comes to protecting our oceans, because we believe that when we protect our oceans, we do protect our security. Our national security when it comes to sea level rise affecting our communities and our military bases. Food security when it comes to solving acidification and researching our aquaculture. And environmental security when it comes to keeping our oceans, our sanctuaries, and our monuments free from oil spills and plastics. But clearly, we cannot do it alone. Clearly, we need people like you who are willing to come here, get information, share information, and keep the fire lit when it comes to our present day issues of protecting our oceans. Because the pressure is going to be coming from the bottom up on our decision makers, and we need to keep that up. We need people like the participants of our next roundtable who you're going to hear from, a group of innovative thinkers who are thinking outside the box on how to get people outside the normal audiences involved in protecting our oceans. We need people to fill the shoes of Margaret Davidson, who worked hard in her unconventional way to bring people together to care about and manage our oceans. And we need people like Jack O'Neill, another person who passed recently. You may know Jack O'Neill from his wetsuits and his surf apparel. We know him in the Santa Cruz and Monterey Bay area as a stalwart steward of the ocean. Yes, his wetsuits allowed people to surf any time and at any temperature, but he also made sure that our children do the same not just with the wetsuit, but with an understanding of the ocean. Jack O'Neill created the O'Neill Sea Odyssey. And what that is is a 65-foot catamaran that acts as a classroom for hundreds of students each season. Basically, it allows students, close to 100,000 now, fourth, fifth, and sixth grades, to get out onto the ocean, to understand the ocean, to appreciate the ocean, and care about the ocean. 
And let me tell you, when you go out on the boat with these students, you see them learning, you see them listening, you see them appreciating the ocean, but most importantly, you hear them laughing. You hear that laugh, which I believe it is up to all of us to continue, so that we can continue making sure that we pass that torch of responsibility to our oceans, to our children. And by being here this week, by seeing all of you that are here in this room, you understand that our future depends on our connections to our oceans. And you understand, and I thank you, for making our legacy that laughter of our children when they experience and enjoy our oceans. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. We really appreciate those mar remarks as one of our emerging leaders in Congress for our oceans. So as I said, our oceans and Great Lakes need visionary leaders. And earlier this month, we lost one of the great ones, Margaret Davidson, who is the architect behind the Vision 4 and a founding director of NOAA's Coastal Services Center. She advocated for the use of science, technology, and community organizing to, inf to inform decisions about coastal areas and to reduce risk to communities. She also engaged emerging marine and coastal leaders early in their careers, urging them to use innovative management and policy approaches to address challenging issues. It's in honor of her life and her visions for oceans and coasts, the N National Marine Sanctuary Foundation will annually host an emerging leaders panel at Capitol Hill Ocean Week. So I'm very excited about this inaugural one that will, is really bringing together some of our most innovative thinkers to discuss their thoughts for environmental sustainability in our globe. Leading the discussion today is Dr. Jeff Payne, who's director of NOAA's Office of Coastal Management. Jeff, more importantly, was a close friend and colleague to Margaret, and I cannot think of anyone better to initiate this inaugural panel. So with that, that, let me introduce Jeff and our wonderful panel. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. This session is in honor of Margaret Davidson. Margaret passed away on May 23rd, just two weeks ago to this day. She was my boss for 15 years. I've known her for about 25 years. And I can honestly say that no boss nor mentor had a greater impact on my professional life than Margaret Davidson. And I know that she touched many people similarly, both professionally and personally. She was an extraordinary woman, kind of a force of nature, with unmatched vision, passion, courage, tirelessness, and yes, even irreverence. She was truly unconventional. We have lost a champion in our work to preserve and conserve our environment. But we know her work and her passion will continue in so many others, especially those that worked with her or were influenced by her. I would like to express my appreciation to the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation for honoring her through this Emerging Leaders session today, and as I understand, to be in the future. So now on to our panel, emerging, leader, emerging Leaders, the next wave. As moderator, I will begin by introducing each of our panelists, a very short introduction, recognizing that we have a little less time. And I do thank Congressman Panetta for coming, uh, sharing his thoughts, his time, and his passion with us, and actually making things very personal. Personable, it can actually um, connect us directly. So first, from my far right, is Reverend Lennox Yearwood, Jr. He is the president and CEO of the Hip Hop Caucus and one of the most influential people in hip hop political life. He is a graduate of the Howard University School of Divinity. He works to bridge the gap between communities of color and environmental advocacy. 
Rolling Stone declared Reverend Yearwood one of our country's new green heroes, and Huffington Post named him one of the top 10 change makers in the green movement. Next in order is Dr. Derek Loftus. He is an assistant research scientist working in the Center for Coastal Resources Management at uh, Virginia Institute of Marine Science. He has a PhD in marine science from VIMS and has been working on sea level rise, street level flood forecasting, and climate change impacts. Number three in order is Dr. Ayana Elizabeth Johnson. She is a marine biologist, conservation strategist, and founder and principal of Ocean Collective, a consulting group that creates and amplifies solutions for healthy oceans while centering on social justice. She teaches at New York University. She earned a BA from Harvard and a PhD from Scripps in marine biology with work on coral reefs. Next in line is Alan Lovewell. Alan holds a bachelor's degree from UC Santa Cruz and a master's from Middlebury Institute of International Studies. He is CEO and co-founder of Real Good Fish, a community-supported fishery in Moss Landing, California, that connects local fishermen with local consumers with weekly, weekly deliveries of high-quality, local, sustainable seafood. And last in order is Dr. Octavio Alberto. He's an assistant professor at Scripps Institution of Oceanography and a professional photographer associate with the International League of Conservation Photographers. He obtained his PhD at Scripps. His research and photographs have focused on marine reserves and commercially exploited marine species and their fisheries. So what I'd like to do is focus our discussion with this esteemed panel this afternoon on issues and opportunities, but also on leadership. This is a panel about emerging leaders in our conservation domain. So I really want to start with a rather general question and one that I'd like each of you to try to answer and give us your uh, impression, is simply to ask each panelist to comment on a primary issue or challenge that connects you to our environment and our people. Is this a ladies first situation? Yes. <laughs> yes. Hi. Um, let's see. I think when I think of emerging issues in ocean conservation, the one that I'm most excited to work on now is urban ocean conservation. So a lot of people, when they think about ocean conservation, we think about remote islands, we think about small island states and coral reefs, we think about fisheries. Um, very few people think about cities. So as a kid who grew up in Brooklyn and barely knew we were on the Atlantic Ocean, um, and I've just moved back um, a year ago, that's what I'm thinking about right now is with the majority of, or a huge portion of the world's population living on the coast, and of those many living in cities, I think this is the next big challenge we need to crack, is how do we do ocean conservation in major metropolitan areas? Um, and I think, you know, the short answer is really around, around collaboration um, and building partnerships. And um, as you described in, in thank you and in introducing me, like making sure that we're taking social justice into account because you have a huge diversity of constituents, um, people using ocean resources in cities. So if we don't do it in an inclusive way, then it just doesn't work. So urban ocean conservation is, is to me the next big challenge. I'd like to build on that because I have a very similar interest as well. Um, through Real Good Fish, we started a program called Bay to Tray, which was um, initiated through um, some scoping that we did through a USDA local food promotion program grant. And what we were looking at was low income, low access areas within our region and sort of figuring out how can we service these places. And when we started to dive into that definition about what it means to be low income, low access, we started to look and, and, and realize real quickly that a lot of our public schools follow that definition. Uh, that the public schools and the children that are attending them 
um, are at high risk, and in fact, probably highest risk of anyone in, in our communities with the lowest amount of income and the lowest amount of access, um, again, depending on what, what district you're, you're at. Um, and so we started this bait to trade program, which was to take, um, which was a bycatch species in uh, our black cod or sable fish fishery, process that and turn that into um, a delicious meal for children. Um, obviously as a way to provide them something nutritious, but also connect them to our community, um, recognizing that I can pretty much guarantee that all of us here, um, you know, the only fish that we experienced in public schools is, was fish sticks. Um, and there's a relationship there that we don't often think about in terms of, you know, what we're experiencing in our meals and at school. Um, and, you know, the ocean and its health. And so using this bycatch species for us was an opportunity to, to introduce this narrative, you know, this narrative of what is bycatch? Um, what does it mean to feed our children local seafood, right? And, and, and as part of that, really diving into this component of access. Who has access to sustainable seafood? You know, the sustainable uh, and sustainability movement has often been criticized as is something for the affluent or the elite. You know, sustainability is only for those who can afford it. And I would argue that sustainability has to be beyond that. Um, we have to look at how is sustainability something about everyday people, about us as a public right, a human right. Um, and, and this issue around children's health, I think, is really, from my point, has started to resonate um, with some of the issues uh, that we, we have to confront as a society, again, in terms of equitability of the ocean um, and its resources. Well, as Jeff mentioned, um, I am assistant professor at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, but also I have been taking photography for more than 20 years. So I'm kind of a hybrid between these two words that sometimes um, they don't speak each other, uh, trying to maximize the impact that we need for um, or to, to solve some of the problems that we are facing in conservation. So two of the main challenges that I'm pursuing or I am involved with is to, um, to see how we can translate, translate science uh, faster and in a better way to really, really influence this um, decision making or actually the, the other are probably more important issue is how we can engage communities and more members of the society to, to be part of the, the, this problem, problem solving. So these are the two things that I, that I think it are very, very important I'm working with, um, but also it's part of um, this lacking of storytelling um, issues that we have in science that in some way um, it has limited our ability as scientists to, to really help with all these issues that we are facing in conservation. Go ahead, Doc. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, in some ways I feel like I'd like to kind of echo some of the concerns that Ayana had brought forth at least a little bit. A lot of my research as an assistant research scientist at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science really focuses on hydrodynamic model development and flood forecasting. And uh, one of the particular challenges that are involved in that is trying to convey that science to the general public, as Ricardo kind of mentioned. One of the real challenges that's involved is trying to convey that science in a way that's palatable for the masses, but allows them to quickly enact change in an informed manner. Um, one of the difficulties that's really uh, that we face now is kind of equitable data management, trying to provide that information in a way that people understand it, but then can also make actionable change and decisions. Uh, a lot of our efforts involve uh, collaborating with municipal partners on trying to share some of our hydrodynamic modeling capabilities to inform city planning and uh, future urban developments, but also uh, provides you some context looking long term in terms of sea level change trends. Uh, really a lot of the difficulty that really is involved there is trying to represent in a model specifically how all these different things will affect flooding in the future as well as right now making it relevant for uh, really future audiences to be able to ingest that information 
and make manageable decisions. The difficulty that really uh, kind of strikes me as the uh, particular forefront is uh, when you're able to share that information, how quickly can people ingest that information? Uh, I run a project called StormSense that specifically focuses on trying to use IoT sensors, which are a big focus of earlier uh, discussions today in the technology sector. Uh, we really discussed specifically how you can use those types of sensors to quickly make information available to the general public, but also to make management-based decisions for emergency response. That allows our first responders to quickly and uh, reliably get back to uh, responding specifically to where help is needed. Uh, the other benefit to that is also that cities can make informed management decisions in the future about their urban development. Uh, specifically, this kind of links back around to kind of social justice because many of those individual neighborhoods that are directly in the floods pathway are specifically neighborhoods that usually are Section 8 housing or other locations where the disenfranchised usually end up occupying. And uh, ultimately, between many of the different cities that have enacted uh, that I've been able to interact with in Hampton Roads, we've kind of found this to be a particular problem. Uh, one particular anecdote I can share is my wife is a uh, school teacher for kindergarten children um, in the Newport News public school system. And uh, nearly 100% of the students in her school are on pay to reduced lunch by government assistance. But when I go to the talk to the students about flooding and some of the very basic level research that I do, they're four and five years old, <laughs> uh, but for the most part, they actually had their own stories to share with me about how they'd experienced flooding. And these are children that are only four and five years old. So this really speaks to the return frequency of flooding and how serious of an issue it really is within the global conservation perspective. So my name is uh, Rev Yewitt. I'm the president of the Hip Hop Caucus. And by being the president of the Hip Hop Caucus and being a part of Chow, Capitol Hill Oceans Week, I've already done half my battle by combining oceans and hip hop together. <laughs> so I can leave now, actually. You can just throw on some biggie and I can just walk off stage. Um, and I'm good. Um, but it's an honor to be here. Most stuff actually has better ocean songs, just for the record. There it is. And actually, <laughs> and, 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 and actually, so on that, I'm actually, we, well, we have a thing at the Hip Hop Caucus called People's climate music um, that we have encouraged many of our artists to get engaged. So artists like Common and Neo and so many other artists who actually did an album um, in 2014 uh, called Heal Our Mother Earth. And they put that out. You can get it on iTunes and, or go to the website and see it. But I think it was this process of how we would use um, activists and artists together. And one of our friends was uh, Adrian Grenier, when you know, my, my, actually my buddy, who runs the Lonely Whale Foundation. Um, um, so with that, let me just say this, though, in regards to the first part about hip hop and oceans and why this is important to connect those dots. Um, before my hip hop life, um, I taught in, in, in many of the universities Actually, Georgetown up the street was one of them, and was also an, an officer in the Air Force. And I say that because while those credentials are nice to have, what I realize is that when I would go back to a lot of our communities from the Bronx or around um, or Detroit, those young children um, were were literally not were hurting and dying. And when it came to discussing the oceans or things outside of their their concrete uh, communities, um, they were not able to see that. So let me just say this, that one of the things that we have to do if we do nothing else is that we need to realize that fighting for, um, against climate change, fighting to transition from fossil fuels to clean energy, fighting so that sea level risings can, can definitely uh, be much more moderate and we can study those in a more appropriate way and have the research to do those things. That is not a partisan issue. That is not about Republican or Democrat. That's literally about fighting for the next generation. Mm -hmm. And so I think that in that process, Hip Hop Caucus, we use our cultural expression to shape our political experience. So that's one thing. The second thing I just want to just kind of highlight about what we're doing at Hip Hop Caucus, one of my goals here is actually to work with you. Um, we would love to work with you because one of the things that we are doing is that we are connecting the dots. 
so that, for instance, when, if we're either out at Standing Rock um, and the water is life, many Mochoni, or we're in Flint, and then with the water coming out of pipes, or we're, we're over in Norfolk, and we're telling them that literally for me, where I came from, Louisiana, and dealing with Hurricane Katrina, um, Norfolk Hampton Roads is actually literally the same way, that you could be next, the same way when you have renters, the same way when you have folks who are poor, the same way you have folks who are near, um, near the, the ocean front. That same situation is very eerily reminiscent of how it was for us um, back on August 29, 2005. And so that is why we have passion for this issue. That is why we want to work together. And that is why one of the reasons we have a caucus, um, we have actually forged an amazing relationship, not only with scientists and activists, but with many communities who are not familiar with oceans in that regard. And that's what we must do if we are going to succeed. Ayana. Just wanted to chime in and say, I think the challenge that I love that Hip Hop Caucus is addressing is, the cultural shift, that's yeah. the challenge, right? Like how do we, it's not just awareness, it's you know people making different decisions that's based right. on different norms, different trends happening. And so how do we go from like Biggie talking about, remember when we had to eat sardines for dinner, that's as right. if that's a bad thing, it's like the most sustainable <laughs> seafood you could possibly eat, right? <laughs> so every time I hear that line, I'm like, no, everybody please eat sardines instead of salmon. Um, <laughs> So I think, I think there's this real opportunity for music in general, for the arts in general, for um, as much as I often cringe, like for celebrity spokespeople to really help to create the cultural shift that needs to happen so that, um, so that this becomes an ever broader movement. Yeah, and I just wanted to follow to that, to that your point, you should cringe about celebrity spokespeople who are just being used to speak about the issue. I think that for too long, we've had too many celebrities who we said, you know, care about the ocean or care about, you know, certain issues, water or climate change or maybe uh, criminal justice or health care. And for too, too many times, they just come in and then we just kind of get them talking points and their audience building. What we have found out is that literally that when artists, when you work with artists, when, you, when they actually want to work with us, they would love to be in this situation and this setting having conversation. That's why I said earlier, why we need to work together. Because they don't want always to be up front on these panels or behind a mic taking pictures. Most of them, now some might not care, but most of the ones that we come across really want to sit down and figure out they are really concerned about the issue. This is what's key in that though. And I think what Ayanna brought forth is, is very important. Using one's cultural expression to shape one's political experience is easier said than done. <laughs> and so I do think that we also as a movement need to have a cultural shift as well so that we can broaden this movement and we can sometimes almost also take it out of the academy, which is so important. We have a saying at Hip Hop Caucus called GADA. It's called Genius Outside the Academy. And that's a little joke there, a little kind of little. <laughs> that's my joke's not working too well. Dude. <laughs> I'm sure this thing's on here. But one of the things there is, is that with GADA, it is important because you are literally going into communities, those five and four-year-olds, and other communities, and then literally giving them the same problem that you would be dealing with, and hearing their responses, and allowing for them to put into their own poetry, allowing them to put into their own art, allowing them to then literally almost put forth a solution to these issues of from the ocean around. And I think if we do more, we have some of the, 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 the photographs that have been, that you are acclaimed for, and we, we have young people looking through their lens, I think that this issue regarding the ocean will become much more relevant for a much more broader base that as we move forth through the 21st century will be critical because we know the end result is not one that we will look for if we don't all come together. Octavio? Yes, and actually we have scientific information proving that when you have this involvement of the community, 
many things in, in conservation, mm. it's, uh, uh, or they have more success. Like for example, uh, marine reserves, marine parks, when the community is involved in everything, actually they request the implementation of these areas, is these are right now the most successful marine reserves around the world. When there is an imposition, when there is a top-down decision just basically saying, hey, here we should put a, a marine reserve and we forget about uh, social justice, uh, everything related with the communities is uh, sometimes we create more problems than the problems that in theory we solve with these conservation instruments. So I think the community, the cultural aspect, it's very, very important if we really want to uh, change uh, these conservation paradig paradigms. And uh, something that I think is missing in, this, in the academic sector is um, scientific studies about how we can engage people, how we can engage communities. There is basically no science about that. So this, I'd like to say that this panel has clearly no reservations about taking over. <laughs> Oh, did my, you want to moderate? You, you, want, you wanted to leave right away, which obviously you didn't. My job is very nearly done. Now, I, I do need to remind everybody as um, moderator here that if you would like to ans ask questions from the audience here physically, you can write out questions on cards and they'll be brought up to me. So moderator duty number two. <laughs> So I think this is a really interesting thread of the conversation. And I, I did start the way I did with, I wouldn't call it a softball question, I call it a question which simply spoke to the, the, the prime interests and passions of, of these people, and, and they shared that with you. And I think we got a great diversity of things, but I, I think we also got commonality. We, we got the intersection of thought and purpose. And, and that to me is a very enriching part of any conversation. So. I wanted to explore that just a little bit more, and I guess one of the things I think about when, when I'm talking about the ocean and coastal domains, and then I think about the marine transportation sector and its influence on how our daily life actually um, is, is handled, there's so much about ports that move all of our lifeblood through the rest of the nation. So kind of using that metaphor and what's already been discussed, um, how is it that we actually can better reach those who are not connected to our oceans, not connected to our coast, not connected to the resources that actually are a part of, of those domains. How, how can we do a better job of that? Oh, lots of ways. <laughs> I think that's, a, I mean, it's, it's a challenge, but it's also just like a really exciting opportunity and, and sort of bring the thread from the last panel. I think there is a role that technology can play. I mean, seeing kids go on a virtual reality scuba dive is pretty amazing as they're just blown away by what it would be like to be underwater in a coral reef or a kelp forest. So there's like a really, or, or to follow shark tagging and see where sharks are moving and kind of like adopt a shark in their heads and, and enjoy that piece. Um, there's also physical interaction with the ocean, which nothing can really replace, whether that's helping to replant mangroves or learning to do you know, water quality sampling. Uh, one of the organizations that I'm most enamored with at the moment is um, the Harbor School and the Billion Oyster Project in New York on Governor's Island. It's a public high school. Any kid can apply to go there, and you graduate with both a high school degree and also a vocational mm -hmm. degree in either um, uh, aquaculture or marine biology or, um, or actually like captaining vessels. And so we have this opportunity to train the next generation of ocean leaders and stewards, and they're replanting a billion oysters in New York Harbor over the next decade. There used to be trillions there, and so these kids are not just the 500 that go there, but everyone that they touch in the city, all 100 restaurants that are contributing the shells that, that support that rebuilding. They have their curriculum in 100 other schools around the city, and I'm excited to work with them to expand that to elementary and middle schools as well. So I think when we think about how to reach 
different communities. There's traditional education, there's technology, there's culture. Um, and I think it depends a lot on you know, what the cultural context is, right? So a lot of my work for the last 10 years was in the Caribbean. And when I think about the loss of coral reefs and fisheries, when I think about climate change and reefs and pollution, I think about not just food security and, and national security, um, which are obviously really big concerns, but cultural security. I mean, if you can't take your grandkids fishing, like that's a really terrible loss in its own right. And so, but at the same time, there are a lot of traditions that don't scale. So it's thinking to me about like the specific cultural context and then, and then what so, how cultural norms need to evolve given the fact that there are now you know, billions more people on the planet and the things that we used to do, whether that's um, you know, fishing with nets or throwing our trash out when it was just banana peels and now it's plastic bottles. How do we shift these, um, these cultural norms, but, but be really cognizant of the context within which we're working always? I think that we should also look at the equity issues um, that are involved around our oceans as well. Um, and I think that's very important looking at what it means to those who are by oceanfront property and how those communities have lived near oceans their entire lives are displaced mm -hmm. um, when um, developers are coming in. And, our, and then on the irony that now that when we're dealing with sea level rising that they're not moving inside and displacing those people who were displaced to begin with to move them back <laughs> to where they already were. Um, I think that's something that we should look at, just connecting the dots that we understand the social justice issues, the, the, the racial issues that have been ingrained around those issues as well. I think as a movement, those who have been dealing with this, um, uh, from the, either from the academy or from the non-governmental organizations, I also think it's important for us to look at how we are diversifying our entities um, and bringing more and trying to enc and encourage more young people um, to literally become part of this movement. I think that's important um, as well. I think there was a recent survey, if you go to um, our website, Hip Hop Caucus, or you just go to my Twitter and you see it's actually pinned there at the top of my Twitter at Rev Yearwood, you'll see the Green 2.0 survey they did on literally the amount of people of color who are working for on boards of, there's a green organization, but I think that's something that can translate throughout the conservation movement. I think the final thing to broaden this movement clearly also goes into, I think, how we talk about it um, and how we describe it um, and how we connect the dots so that um, people who may not be familiar or think it's their issue, we are now dealing with climate refugees. One of the things the military has said that the issue of global warming is the national security threat of the 21st century. And where I'm from in Louisiana, uh, we, now had, we now have those who are being paid um, to leave. I know that we talked about it earlier in Staten Island. Um, there are many communities who are now being actually being plays. And that, and, and that type of uh, migration could become the new normalcy. And I think that's very scary. And so I think that we need to have those conversations, talking with these communities. Um, and I just want to close with this, because this is me being from Katrina being from Louisiana and, and having seen what Katrina did. Um, a couple weeks ago, I know you mentioned um, losing Margaret and others. Um, we lost at the same time, actually, somebody in New Orleans named Mama D. Um, and Mama D was, uh, was uh, just like a, 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 one of those leaders in the community. And just to tell you what she did, to tell you how this affects, when the, seat, when, when the levees um, broke, Mama D was there and she stayed in her home. She was a beautiful, African-American woman with, with long gray dreadlocks and about small in stature, but about 60. I just, when, when, the, when the levees broke, the rivers came down her street on Dergewan Street. And when they were coming down, she was at the, kind of like the, like the bottom of the hill, and so the water was rushing down. And so what she did was that she would literally go out there, and as the bodies of her neighbors were flowing down the street, she, would, she was determined not to let them be lost or be eaten by alligators. And so she would literally go out there with her son and would tie her neighbors to the tree. 
And, and she had like four or five neighbors who she, would, who she caught and she tied them to the tree so they wouldn't be lost. I think telling those real stories of what, it, what, what our inaction would lead to is also what would also help us to broaden our movement. People can really see that this is about life or death and what it means for the next generation. So I want to bring um, Alan and Derek a bit into the conversation, maybe coming back to both some of the, the physical issues as well as uh, sustainability issues and, and access uh, to um, the nature of the work that you do, Alan. So with our um, low-lying Pacific communities, Ildijan, St. Charles in Louisiana, Western Alaskan communities, we, we have issues of equitability. We have issues of uh, potential for relocation of populations, of, of retreat or, or managed retreat, as they say these days. And, and that is forced by um, physical changes in the environment, primarily. Uh, we're seeing that along the East Coast as well. And, and Derek, when uh, he talked about his work at BIMS, uh, really hit that on the head. And, and I think that um, he may have some other perspectives on both what is happening scientifically, physically, but also connecting this back to the people, to the communities. Because on the East Coast, we have the Gullah Geechee community in South yeah. Carolina, where I come from. And, and it is a community that does not have the resources to actually get up and move, whereas others may be more capable, so. Well, whenever you gotta displace a population, it's always uncomfortable for the city and truly everyone involved. Um, ultimately, uh, my experience with any elements of this is mostly uh, you know, the trying to manage your flood risk, a place that's continually being repeatedly flooded, you know, the flood adaptation uh, strategies there is usually to either displace the population so they don't keep getting flooded regularly as uh, you know, influences of climate change continue to advance some of these uh, or exacerbate existing conditions. Um, and it's difficult because a lot of folks have lived there perhaps their whole life or for many generations, in fact. Um, and the real challenge with that is that usually, uh, from my perspective, running hydrodynamic models and predicting flooding, is you know, the regular return frequency of how often the flooding continues to come back to those same locations. At a certain point, a you know, managed retreat is inevitably uh, you know, where things have to go, just from a perspective that a government can't keep constantly bailing folks back out. You know, the flood in uh, the uh, Federal Emergency Management Agency, uh, FEMA's got a great program uh, called the community rating system that ultimately offers credits for conversion to open space for particular areas that are recurrently flooded. Um, and one of the real challenges that's involved, of course, is trying to get communities that are willing to actually try to approach those credits to provide some sort of commensurate feedback uh, in terms of what potential uh, things they could offer their community in terms of trying to relocate folks that are constantly affected because emergency responders have to go into those locations regularly whenever the flooding continues to come back to those locations. And the street level hydrodynamic modeling capabilities that we've kind of developed at our uh, research group at VIMS really allows you to go down to the scale on spatial resolution of seeing it, you know, 15 foot resolution or close to five meters. So you're not now guessing whether or not specific city blocks in New York City, where I conducted my dissertation on Hurricane Sandy, you're looking at not specific city blocks, but parts of your driveway and which parts are going to be flooded. Now, in terms of accountability and data management, that's particularly complex because you have to share that information publicly so that all have equitable use and access to that information. Uh, but usually you have to start in a broader scale, like sharing that information with city planners so they can make informed decisions on where to build things uh, that will be ultimately resilient in the future to future flooding, but also considering emergency management so they know specifically where they can allocate their resources for first responders in advance of a flood event. Uh, each of those sorts of things really kind of brings me to uh, the privilege that I have of kind of working with uh, Octavio kind of alluded to at the end, I guess, uh, briefly discussing how the uh, challenges that you know, trying to get local legislature and even statewide legislature involved on directly addressing issues related to uh, conservation and ocean management. Really, uh, the Commonwealth Center for Recurrent Flooding Resilience has been a great opportunity within the Commonwealth of Virginia where it's enabled smaller leaders like myself based on our legislative leader's action to establish a center that allows it to dedicate its time and focus uh, towards addressing specific problems that are dealing with recurrent flooding and how we become more resilient in our management of those problems. Uh, usually the rigmarole in academia is that you're looking for something that's publishable or constantly chasing after grants. But instead, this allows 
uh, universities, uh, researchers time to be bought towards focusing specifically on local problems that are affecting uh, direct populations uh, within the flood patterns way. And so, uh, and try and share that information. Usually, you need a lot of information very quick in advance of that particular type of event. Uh, so that's where, uh, in time, trying to guide the StormSense project that I lead towards trying to share information publicly with folks in a way that's easily accessible to all. Most people best understand things like pictures you know, from a photographer's perspective, or trying to understand maps, specifically seeing, well, there's where my house is. Specifically, they want to know where's the flooding going to happen, when and for how long. That map will quickly share that information with people and best understand where they can access that information and how they can make actionable change in advance of that. And so kind of trying to bridge those gaps really allows us to enable uh, sharing that information publicly in a way that people can actually better their own experience from a day-to-day -day operation, but also in long term into the future. Yeah, yeah thank you. And, and not necessarily in the same thread, but I, I set it up, so I wanted to come back to you, Alan, and sure. this is actually a question from Twitter. So, uh, and it, it, it comes back to something you even said in your opening statement. Uh, the question is, who has access to sustainable seafood? Yeah, absolutely, and I think there's a lot of commonalities, you know, when I'm thinking about sea level rise and who gets affected um, with climate change, and, and when we think about sustainability of our ocean and seafood supplies, who's gonna be affected the most? And this is where we start getting into you know, the really um, difficult question of, of equitability and, and how you know, rights and resources are being distributed throughout our communities. Um, and for us, what we're thinking about, again, as a community-supported fishery, thinking both about the fishermen and the consumer, um, is access both from the fisherman standpoint, that is to say, which fishermen get access to go fishing these days. Um, we're seeing a huge, uh, massive uh, ocean grab, so to speak, when it comes to quotas and permits around various um, schemes. And what we're seeing is that it's becoming more and more difficult as a young fisherman uh, to make your way and make a living in the industry as the resource and its rights are being consolidated further up the supply chain. And then on the consumer side of things, you know, you know, we can all talk about all the amazing innovative work that's being done uh, in the field of sustainability, both in aquaculture, which now accounts for over 50% of global seafood uh, production, um, as well as wild production in terms of the ways in which folks are innovating and, and reducing bycatch um, and the ways in which um, utilizing uh, more of their catch. And what we're seeing is that with that is a price divide that's being, and a price rift that is, is driving um, this certification, a lot of certification schemes, um, you know, a lot of the conversations around sustainable seafood. Um, and, and with that, you know, the, the, the conversation is essentially around, you know, if you can invest in making things more sustainable, people out there will pay for it. Well, a lot of people will, but there's a lot more people that won't. And that's a problem. And so when we think about you know, seafood sustainability, when we think about ocean health, I think what we're trying to do, uh, again, at a really fundamental level, um, is meet people where there are, look at where there's tremendous amount of inefficiency, um, find those opportunities, those little window of, of opportunities that I think usually we overlook, largely because we take it for granted, largely because um, we don't think about how the ocean is integrated in our day-to-day -day life, but the reality is, is, is when we talk about equitability, we talk about access, we talk about awareness, you know, the ocean is the common thread that binds us all together. And I think the more we open our eyes to that and look at the ways in which um, the ocean, you know, provides for us, it's not hard to see that in any given moment, you know, with every breath we take, um, with every meal, when we're sitting down to a restaurant and looking at the menu and seeing what options are there, um, the ocean is, in fact, very much a part of our lives, and it's only through that lens of, of, of opening our eyes to that, again, the plastic bags, you know, the initiative there that have taken place in terms of, I think, you know, reducing the amount of plastic bags, largely around as we're promoting it, not ending up in the ocean, but it's really more about, you know, ending up in landfills and, and ultimately, hopefully, not ending up in oceans, but, it, you know, that was a very successful campaign as an example. But anyways, the ways in which the ocean and decisions that we make in a day-to-day -day life um, can influence, again, you know, the long-term sustainability and health of our oceans and what it means also, you know, from a community standpoint. And I think to that point, um, not necessarily taking this top-down approach that says, you know, this is the way to do it, but trying to create that space. There's this open space 
for every community to have this conversation, um, to define themselves, and it starts to look a lot like culture in terms of what is the ocean culture that we want to have? How does it integrate it into our lives? And it might be the seafood. It might be the music. Um, it might be the storytelling. There's all these different ways in which culture gets built, but I think it's our jobs as leaders, our jobs as examples of, of what we can do in communities to open that up, to really open up our hearts and, and, and demonstrate that if, if you take that risk, if you show that passion, that need, um, that people will come and they will, they will share that story, they will share that vision, and, and they will be co-creators right. in that movement. Um, because it's not for us to decide, it's not for us here sitting up here um, to define what this means. We're sharing experiences and what work in our, con in our specific context with the specific cultures that we work within. And we hope that, and I hope that, you know, what we're doing is creating inspiration largely so that others can, can take that idea of being inclusive, being collaborative, and understanding that the ocean is part of our everyday life. How do we make it more prevalent? How do we make it more real? I would add that seafood sustainability is a really interesting one because it syncs so closely with health and toxicity, That's right? Great. So you have, um, I mean, you have in New York City, you have immigrant communities fishing off the piers and eating that mm -hmm. seafood out of New York Harbor, which is not really a very safe option. Um, you have the same thing in San Diego, but the water's much cleaner there, so it's a different scenario. So figuring out how not just sustainability, but human health can be synced. Um, and in a lot of places, there's a chance for, um, for those two to be leveraged together. And, and often communities will understand health first and sustainability second, because you're just trying to meet your more basic needs. And I think when you talk about you know, creating that space culturally and, and engaging communities and, and providing opportunity for these discussions, and I think each of us have talked about the importance of telling stories. And so you have a bunch of people on this stage with a bunch of fancy degrees who are talking about how do we tell better stories <laughs> about ocean conservation? How do we communicate this better? How do we do this in a way that's more, not just interdisciplinary, but inclusive? Um, I think I think if the future looks more like y'all on this stage, we're heading in a really good direction. Yeah, th this is great, and, and we do only have a couple of minutes left. And what I wanted to actually end with was uh, a question for each of you about what does make you optimistic for the future? Uh, you know, what are your positive messages for today? And we've already heard from Alan and Ayana about that, I think. So I'm going to turn to the other three panelists and offer you the opportunity as well to talk about what makes you optimistic about the future. Well, I think um, there are more and more people participating in this movement. Uh, more, we have more technology to share these experiences. We, we have challenges, like you mentioned virtual reality. Everyone now, they can experience this virtual reality. But I think what we need is a virtual connectivity. Yes, because we need to join this point and um, and uh, uh, we need to do more efforts to do more science to understand how we can engage people. Go ahead, Grover. No, no, thank you. So I think I'll, just, I'll end where I started with, so that my purpose here was to work with you and to humbly do that with everybody, because I think that we have learned at the Pop Caucus, as we try to revitalize vulnerable communities, that we need all of us to work together. And so there is a want for us to figure that out. Um, and that makes me, um, it, that encourages me. I'm very clear on what the science says. I'm very clear on what is happening with our oceans. I'm very clear what's happening in our, in our communities. Um, but I'm also clear that I believe in humanity. And I still believe um, that organized people beats organized money every single time. <laughs> and so because of that, I believe that we can still do it. And with that, um, please reach out to, oh, this, you have somebody about caucus who's been here like every single year. So Mark, just wave your hand in the front row. That's, that's give it up for Mark, y'all. Give it up for Mark, <laughs> give it up for Mark, yes. Give it up for Mark. So Mark, is our new director of communications for the Hip Hop Caucus. He used to be at the White House and CEQ 
but he has been at this conference. He was like so excited for me to be at this conference because he's been at every single year. And so he was, so, he was like, man, this is going to be so dope. We're going to be at this conference. So please, holla. <laughs> so, so I was like, and I can tell, this is pretty dope. So holla at Mark, please, um, while you're out there, or me, so we can be in contact together. So Derek, you have the last word in 30 seconds or less. Yep. Well, uh, obviously, uh, just seeing some of the other colleagues here from the panel today, I'm certainly optimistic for the future. Um, I think uh, really some of the experiences that I've gained is that uh, really understanding that really we're the sum of the whole of our experiences in our lives. And really, uh, all the people that have interacted with us and enabled us to become the emerging leaders that we are. And I think it was James McGregor Burns that said that essentially established transformational leadership as the gold standard for what folks should achieve. Or, uh, you know, speak to aspire to. Uh, it's really uh, to recognize the change that they need to see in the world and ultimately inspire others to kind of work towards that managed solution for change in the world. And then finally at the end is bringing everything back together by working with colleagues to achieve that vision. And I think that uh, all of us are working at, towards that in our different ways. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you to the panelists. I agree with Ayana that with these five folks here, we're in good hands. And I remember an old saying, yes, we can. Indeed, we can. We can so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I really want to thank um, all of our panelists here. This was a great way uh, to end the day. I don't know if you know, but it, through all your comments, you actually kind of summarized the day very nicely. And I just want to pick up on a couple of things that I heard. And I'm going to start with one of the last things I heard, which is organized people beat organized money every time. And I think that's great. I started out the day with a bit of a call to action, and that's why I like that so much is whether we act personally or whether we act in partnership, we can take action for our oceans. And that was something I think that came so clear th um, through uh, during this panel. I love the talk about the needing to be inclusive, to tell stories, to try to figure out how you engage people through ways that are engaging to them. I love that we talked about the, the challenges that our ocean faces from sustainability to the ties to human health. But again, it came back to the fact that we can actually make a difference. So where there's a problem, there's a solution that we can um, find. And I think, um, while not directly addressed, um, one of our themes was technology as a game changer. And I think you can recognize that there's ways we can actually use technology as a great tool, both for the management, but also to, to engage communities in the conversation. So thank you so much also for kicking off this inaugural panel. It was great. I think it was a true tribute to Margaret Davidson. And if you don't mind, I'm just going to do a couple of logistics before we end at the day. So I hope everybody had a really great first day. We're going to keep the conversation going tomorrow at 8.30 a.m. with a virtual reality dive into our sanctuaries. If you're not registered to attend, please feel free to stop by the registration table and sign up for premier uh, membership. Uh, also, I want to um, say as we close day one, a huge thanks to our uh, two uh, signature sponsors, the Walton Family Foundation and Vulcan Inc. And I'm hoping that we can roll their uh, videos now. There's Once again, thank you for a fantastic first day. We'll see you all back here at 10 a.m. for continued conversations. And don't forget to check the app, Chow 2017, to see more about talk times and topics. Thank you very much. See you later.